This video is brought to you by people like you, our amazing Patreon supporters. You make us want to be the best. Your support and input helped us create this video. If you want to join the crew and get exclusive perks like early access, check out our Patreon link in the description. Every little bit helps and we really appreciate it. Now, let's jump into the video. The equation that you see here holds the secrets to everything we can see in the universe. I know that this formula probably looks intimidating. It did to me when I first saw it, but I'm gonna show you today how we can start with a completely empty universe, make just one assumption, ask just one simple question, and from that derive the entire theory of matter. We're actually going to build a universe starting with a completely empty space-time. If you've always wanted to learn how physicists can explain the universe simply by using a pen and paper and some math, now, I normally don't make hyperbolic claims, but I think you might just get blown away if you follow me to the end of this video. You don't want to miss what's coming up right now. So let's set the stage. I'm going to introduce the gauge principle to you. Now, don't get bogged down by the name. This is just a physics principle that is the basis for all fundamental interactions in quantum field theory. Quantum field theory is the theory that describes all matter and all forces in the universe, except gravity. So now imagine an empty universe with nothing in it. Let's now add a field that permeates the entire universe. You might ask, well, what's a field? A quantum field is not made of anything. It is a mathematical concept. You can think of it simply as properties in space-time. The analogy would be like the temperature distribution in a room. The distribution is not made of anything. It's just properties of different parts of the room. So if you took the temperature in one corner, it might be different than the temperature in another corner. You could make a temperature grid of space-time in the room this way. A field is kind of like this. It represents certain properties in space-time. So in our empty universe, with literally nothing, we imagine a field that exists everywhere. Let's make it more concrete. We can say that this is the electron field. We can model such a field with the Dirac Lagrangian, which is an equation describing all fermion fields, including the electron field. Now, don't get nervous about the math. I'll explain what we're looking at here. The Lagrangian simply describes the difference between a system's kinetic and potential energy. Since any matter field must contain both particles and its counterpart, antiparticles, both are represented here. The psi bar represents the wave function of the anti-electron or positron, and the psi represents the wave function of the electron. The left term in the parentheses represents the field's kinetic energy. It captures how the particles move in space-time. And the m is the mass, representing the potential energy of the field. You might ask, why is there an imaginary term? every time you see a quantum mechanics equation? Well, it has to do with the fact that we are describing wave functions, which have complex components. The eye is necessary to describe them mathematically. It's a mathematical convenience. The eye doesn't represent anything physical. In the end, for anything measurable, we will only have real numbers. So you might say the eye is just a means to an end. The partial derivative, del mu, just captures the change in the coordinates which is motion. The I gamma mu is a complex mathematical matrix term introduced by Dirac to correctly describe matter particles. For now, don't get bogged down by where it comes from. Just know that it represents the kinetic energy of the particle. Now, what's fascinating about this equation is, is how useless it is. But it's fundamental. It's useless because it doesn't describe anything measurable. It just describes a field with no interactions. Without interactions, we can't measure anything. In fact, without interactions, we wouldn't even be able to detect this field. But it's fundamental because this is the best thing we have that correctly describes how matter works. The equation describes the electron field with two excitations, that of the electron and that of the anti-electron. What do I mean by excitation? An excitation is simply like a bundle of energy in the field, corresponding to the energy of the particle. And this field spans all of space-time. So very simply put, what this is describing is an electron with a mass m which can move in space-time. To make this equation come to life, we have to introduce the gauge principle. 
To do that, we have to make a demand to this equation. The demand we're going to make is that this equation must have a symmetry, like that of a circle with a radius of one. Basically, what we're saying is that if we rotate the entire field in any direction, it should act the same. Nothing should change. So consider a 2D plane with the x-axis being the real plane and the y-axis being the imaginary plane. Then we can make a circle going from the real plane to the imaginary plane, and the radius of the circle will be 1. A circle is particularly interesting because you can rotate the circle in an infinite number of ways. I can turn it 90 degrees, 45 degrees, 45.1 degrees, or anything I want. Doing so should not lead to a change. Now, it might seem arbitrary why we would want to demand this kind of symmetry of the theory, but I promise you this will make sense in the end, and you may be blown away. Now, to force this symmetry demand on our 2D plane, we add a term that contains the angle theta, representing the rotation of our field. Then we check if the theory changes by doing this. So the psi becomes psi e to the i theta, and psi bar becomes psi bar e to the negative i theta. Now, nothing should change if the symmetry holds. If we insert this transformation back into the Dirac Lagrangian, we get the following, where the i theta transforms our original equation. But we can simply move the exponential terms like this. And then we see that the exponential rotational terms just cancel out, and we get our original equation back. This shows us that the equation obeys the symmetry of our circle globally. In other words, if we rotate the whole field spanning the entire universe by any degree, it won't change. By the way, this is called U1 symmetry, which this Lagrangian obeys. But what if we demand that this symmetry be valid locally at some arbitrary space-time coordinate x? In other words, we're asking whether this equation changes if we rotate the field at some confined location rather than globally. In this case, the transformation depends on the space-time coordinate x, which looks like this. So in this case, the psi transforms to psi e to the i theta x, and the psi bar transforms to the psi bar e to the negative i theta x. So the theta now becomes theta x due to our local symmetry demand. We now insert this transformation once again into the Dirac Lagrangian. But now because when the del mu term acts on the theta x term, after doing the math, we get an extra term in the final equation. So this equation has changed from the original. This means that the local rotation we demanded breaks the symmetry. So what now? Is our theory dead? Is the game over? No. In fact, this is our guide to make one of the greatest theories in physics. We ask, what can we do to make the symmetry demand work? And this is where the mathematics forces us to do things that blows the mind. It turns out that the solution to regain the symmetry is to introduce a new field, a force field, the photon field. If instead of just writing the Dirac Lagrangian like this, we write the Dirac Lagrangian with the photon field, it looks like this, where Q is the electric charge and A sub mu is our new photon field. This allows the equation to transform in such a way that it does obey the symmetry of our circle in the 2D plane. Now, I'll go through the math so that you can see it, but you can skip this part if it's too overwhelming. The important thing is the result. So when we transform both the fermion and the photon field, these are the terms that describe that transformation. Again, theta x is the angle of local rotation. So let's go through the steps of the math where we insert these terms into our original Dirac Lagrangian. I'm just going to stay quiet and we're going to animate the math so that you can see what's happening. After doing the math, we get the extra term as before, but also another new term from the photon transformation. This is what the equation looked like without the photon field, and this is what the equation now looks like with the photon field. And this new third term, it turns out, 
cancels the second term we didn't want to have. And so we are now back to the original equation describing the electron field interacting with the photon field. We just demonstrated that we have local symmetry of the electron field if we introduce a new force field mediated by photons. This means that by adding the photon field with the appropriate transformation, also called a gauge transformation, we can restore symmetry, called U1 symmetry. And we now have an interacting theory where the extra term we're forced to add is the QED interaction. This is the basis of quantum electrodynamics, which is the theory of the electromagnetic force. It shows us how electromagnetism interacts with anything that has an electric charge. And this result comes from the simple local symmetry demand that we made on our matter field. Why is this in any way meaningful? We just added a little extra term to the equation. Remember what we did. We have not asked the universe for anything particularly complex. We simply took our equation for a free electron field that can't be measured. Remember I said it's a useless theory that doesn't do anything. And we have simply said, assume some symmetry exists where the electrons transform with this phase factor theta, and then perform the necessary modification to the theory, which the mathematics of the situation forces us to do. And from this, we were forced to add the photon field in the form of an interaction with the electrons, so this now makes it a useful theory because there's an interaction that we can detect. In fact, we can see what we did with this extra term in this simple QED Feynman diagram. We can read this diagram as an electron interacting with a photon. An electron comes in from the left side, absorbs a photon. The energy of the photon moves the electron to a higher energy state on the right. Think about this. This is the interaction of electromagnetism responsible for everything you see. Everything because you need photons to see with your eyes. You feel electromagnetic interactions when something touches your skin. Electromagnetism is the way you experience the world, and it is how we measure basically anything. Without this interaction, the universe wouldn't be much of anything to us. How electrons and atoms go from one shell to another, absorbing or emitting photons as light and like an LED lamp, it all boils down to this simple term a term we must have to comply with the symmetry we wish to add to our theory. Now, if you like this and you want more, there's a part two to the video that I'll make if there's enough interest. It turns out that we can add another term to this equation that also satisfies the symmetry, which allows us to then derive all of Maxwell's equations, which would give us the complete description of electromagnetism. Until then, Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video, my friend.